in relation to the dogs. Um, and with me in studio today is Dr. Kavosa Mudoga, who is the companion animal uh, campaign manager at the World Animal Protection. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do at the animal, uh, World Animal Protection. So by profession, I'm a veterinarian and I work in the area of advocacy. And in the area of advocacy and welfare is where we work with governments and communities to help understand and help push the needs for animals. So you said my terminology is at the, the companion animal campaign manager, which is a, <laughs> a lot of words. Yeah. But what it means that in my department, I am in charge of animals that are considered com companion or live in close contact with humans. So it's like cats, dogs, pet birds, and even the donkeys. Um, apart from that, our other departments, we have a farming department, which deals with farming. Then we have a wildlife department that deals with animals in the wild. And then we have the animals in disasters. And in the animals in disasters is where, as you know, when disasters happen, not only are humans displaced in disasters, so also animals. And the thing about it is when help comes in, usually by the time the human being settled down, those animals, they have the eggs and the milk and the meat is usually a first choice for food consumption and for trade while they settle down again. So now it has been recognized how important it is to save also the animals in disasters okay. when you're doing the human beings. Okay. So when you talk about welfare, what is welfare and why is it important? Um, welfare has always been there. And in Africa, surprisingly, we have always been close to an animals and we always consider welfare. The thing is that welfare almost sounds like a Western terminology. So to bring it closer to home, it's called keeping an animal within the systems that are best for it, both in its physiological state, what it requires, and its environment. In school, in agriculture, it's more or less closer to saying animal husbandry and production. Okay. So when we talk about animal welfare in relation to the dog, what are some of these uh, freedoms? Um, basically, in the world, there are about five freedoms for all animals. For one thing is that we understand that all higher animals are sentient which means just like you, they have emotions, they've got feelings, and they've got understanding. And most of you may laugh, but if you go up country, most your grandmother, many grandmothers have this relationship even with their chicken, they understand her, they talk to her. <laughs> yeah, true. People who are brought up with their dogs, it's as if they talk to each other, they can understand. So animals actually do have an understanding. Even if you go to the wildlife system, you'll notice if you walk in a national park, you'll be attacked. But if you see a lion sees a person, a KWS officer in their ranger uniform, they know who they are and they understand each other, which, as I said, animals do, like human beings, have mm. a form of understanding and emotions. So now, there are basic five freedoms, and these ones are arranged as in the freedom from food and hunger, freedom from distress. Then you have freedom from pain, injury, and disease. Then you have freedom to express natu natural behavior, and then freedom from fear, which is almost almost exactly the same as the, human, the basic freedoms for human beings. Okay. But they've been split in five sectors. OK, if we start by, uh, looking at them one by one, let's start with the, um, the freedom for um, fast and anger. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the, the, these freedoms and, and why, why? why is it important? So just like uh, the human being, all animals, for their health and sustenance, they need a proper balanced diet. And just like human beings, you also need proper sufficient um, water, source of water intake. So now what we are saying is that this freedom is where all animals are allowed to have a proper amount of water and not just any water. We're talking about portable water. That is water that you, I as a human being, can drink. What people mistake is that they go and get a certain type of water and filter our water for human beings. Then for your dog, your cat, your cow, you just go and get any puddle of water. The only problem is that when you take this water and this water has bacteria or viruses, that bacterial virus is going to end up causing your dog, your cat, or your cow to end up becoming sick. And then you wonder why your animal is losing weight, it's having diarrhea, it's having skin issues, but it's because you're not giving proper water. Apart from that, just like human beings, animals need water to clear the toxins in the body through their kidneys. And they need it also to um, generate and cool their, their body systems, just like human beings. So when you don't give an animal enough water, you're causing problems with their body organs like the liver and the kidney, which at the end of the day, it ends up becoming costs or you lose productivity 
that you could have had because the animal gets sick and dies young. So you make a loss on your point of view. As for food, just like anybody else, the dog and the cat to have a proper body and to be healthy, they need a proper balanced diet. For your cow to, to be healthy, produce milk, and be able to take a calf to term, your, <laughs> whether it's your goat or your sheep, they need a proper diet. If they don't have a proper diet, then their bodies cannot produce what you want and they cannot sustain themselves. Just like a human being, if you don't have proper food, you will starve, and when you starve, your health goes in the opposite direction, and at times, eventually, it can cause death. Okay. From where you sit, uh, do you think us as a country, um, we treat our dogs that way um, when it comes to this particular freedom of thirst and hunger? Um, when it comes to this particular freedom of thirst and hunger, I'd say um, where we have been is that most people don't have a proper understanding. Yes, because where we've worked in communities, people want to have their dogs, they love them, but they don't have the clear understanding of what the vital need is. But where there have been organizations where they've worked and taught people, people have now put things into place. Even us here in Nairobi or in cities where we keep dogs and cats in-house, unless somebody has gone to their veterinarian or they go up, very many people you find come into clinics with a dog with an issue and it's all just nutrition. And when you explain to them, <laughs> they're like, wow. So it, we are in a place where some people know, some people don't know. But you'd be so amazed that the community that actually do this without, which is, I think it's integral to them. I think it's because animals and livestock are the part. If you go to like the Mas Masai and Samburu communities, and you see how those dogs are taken care of. In the morning when people get water, everyone gets water, when milk is given, the animal is given milk. When they go hunting on animals, it's given its portion. So I think, surprisingly, the, the dogs that have the highest <laughs> welfare are in those communities that most people like, um, as I'd say, live almost in their traditional values, mm -hmm. which shows in Africa, in our traditional, values and states, we had those things, but somehow a long time as we modernized, they seem to have gotten lost along the way, but mm -hmm. we are coming back. <laughs> so we are not doing badly as a country? We are not doing badly. Okay, let's go to the freedom from pain, injury and disease. So the pay, that freedom is basically talking about healthcare. Mm -hmm. That when your animal is sick or it is injured for you to take an animal to a veterinarian or call the veterinarian or the uh, animal health professional, because in Kenya, apart from veterinarians, we have paraprofessionals, which are animal health officers, uh, who can also treat your dogs and your cats. And you'd see most of them in Kenya, we call them AHAs, animal health assistants. The terminology is interchanged <laughs> as you go. So just like when a human being is sick, mm -hmm. you do not feel well, your functionality goes down. So even when animals are sick, their bodies do what your bodies will do and try to close down so that the animal is just trying to sustain itself and to keep alive. So now, in dogs and cats, you can notice when they are sick and they have pain, they will be like, they lie down, they don't want to do anything, they enclose themselves, and then you have a guard dog and you're wondering what is happening. If they have other diseases, then you can see things happening like a dog is not running anymore, a dog cannot eat, your dog is going blind, your dog is losing weight. So if you don't maintain their health, at the end of the day, just like in a human being, the disease ends up killing the animal and reducing its productivity. So that's why we have to maintain its health status. Okay. Um, growing up in the village, um, mm -hmm. I used to remember we used to uh, also have dogs. And sometimes they could get sick, but now um, my parents will now are in a catch-22 situation. Do we treat the dog or we take care of the cows? And most of the time, they'll always go for the cow, and the dog will, will end up suffering. Um, what do we need to, to do to find this balance, to also help these communities understand that um, uh, regardless that we, uh, and, uh, even as we think the cow is more important than the dog, mm -hmm. the dog is still as important as the same cow? So as I, what we have done, and where we've gone in communities and where organizations, what we do is when we sit down with communities, we, we actually tell them, they say, but it's a dog. Then we sit down and tell them, OK, tell us how important your dog is. So by the time they list the things the dog does for them, <laughs> they actually do realize, wow, <laughs> the dog is actually yeah, important. And th the thing is, what they don't understand is that many people know that the vet and the animal health assistant treats the cow and the pig. Many people still don't relate relate that they can treat, they also treat the dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's something that still has to link with people. And apart from that, 
at the end of the day, when you actually make people realize that some of the sicknesses that the cow is having, some of those bacterial or worm or fungal infections, if it gets into the dog and then you treat only the cow, the dog continues being a source and can pass it back to the cow or can pass it back to small children whom dogs play around with. I'm sure you've seen where dogs have a skin issue and then after some time, children within the village tend to also have the that same, same issue. Yeah. Ah, okay. So now when you get people to understand the importance of how the dog is actually a medium of, you can, if you don't treat it, a disease, between your livestock and human being, but it can also be a protective barrier if you actually take that step. Okay. And, and, it's, and it's just, as I said, it's just that small point of where more education has to be brought across in that area. Okay. Let's move to the third freedom. That is the freedom to express uh, normal behavior. So just like human beings, most animals have social norms. Most people laugh, you're like, oh yeah. <laughs> but just the way we human beings ha have we're in families and we have communities, um, the way we spend time, socialize with each other, the way human beings of different personalities, you have the human beings who can be the joke and the clown of, of the house, and then mm -hmm. you have those ones who would rather much be in a room with a book. So like also for dogs, cats, even cows, each and every one of them has different personalities. And people who have actually grown up and work on the farm, most farmers, when you go to visit them, apart from each cow, when you go to close to the cow, they can tell you, oh, Sophie is like this, this, and this. Yeah, Paul does not like X, Y, Z. So even for dogs, they're like that. And the thing for a dog is that dogs, even in the wild, they're social animals, they're pack animals. So dogs live as families. Mm -hmm. So in the household, when you own a dog, you're the dog's family. So as a household, you also have to meet that social need where you are the family to the dog and you allow the dog to be part of that family. Another thing is that dogs love a lot of socialization. That's why in the evening in the village, the dog disappears for about two hours and you find them all roaming in groups because it's in the evening, they are coming together to discuss as we make fun up. when we talk to people, catch up on what we did, <laughs> where are we going to see, remember yesterday what happened, let's go and check and then just have that small talk up and, and then they go back home. <laughs> so that is what is weird. Cats are more, as I say, the type who, it's me, myself, and I, and maybe I'll have one or two other cats that I like. But even with us, we can stay together and say hello, but I like my own personal space. Okay. Yeah. Um, there's this thing, uh, I see this reason, um, dog, the dog business has become a real thing. Mm -hmm. uh, people are selling puppies. Um, the process of uh, either selling or giving someone a puppy, what impact does it have on them, their mother when their small, small puppies, puppies are given off? So now we usually advise that the puppies are given away after they're three months of age. Okay. Yeah, and they're fully weaned and they fully have their first, if best, their second set of vaccinations. And most likely what will happen is that a female dog, mm -hmm. when she is ready and she needs the puppies to go, you'll notice that she's giving them freedom and she doesn't mind when they wander or people go away. So now the best thing we say is when people are buying a dog, it's best that they can actually go to the home and the dog is given, the puppy is given, is the, the dog is introduced to the person who's taking the puppy. And there's that handing over. For that one, is, it's psychologically to the, to the mother, it's more peacemaking because she knows where her puppy has gone, it's gone to another person, and it's time for the puppy to go away. Ah, okay. Yes. So, in short, they really have feelings. They really have feelings, and you, it's, uh, many people, unfortunately, take them aw too, well, away too early when the mother is not yet ready to release them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. The fourth uh, freedom is about uh, fear and distress. Yes. Or the far more physical. So, fear and distress, as I said, um, animals have emotions. Mm -hmm. So now, just like human beings, where we say, torture, and torture is not only kicking the animal, it's also psychological torture. Just like human beings, this psychological torture can have a negative feedback. And one of the thing is, we people say we need a Kali dog, we need a Kali dog. So all you do is that people beat or mistreat that dog so it can become Kali. You have not made that dog Kali, you have put fear in that dog. And what you see is a feedback of fear. And the problem with the feedback of fear, even with a human being, you can push a human being so far with their fear and one day when they reach that corner when they know I don't have anything to lose, mm -hmm. they will turn on you. 
And that's where you've had people being attacked by their dogs, which they call Kali dogs. Others, they lock their dogs and they only come out at night and lock them in again. And people are saying it's a Kali dog, but it's not a Kali dog. The dog has actually psychologically gone mad. Mm -hmm. And we've had one sad case where the former uh, governor who passed away in, in Nyeri, whose grandchild, and that was a situation with those dogs that came from across the fence. Because most dogs, a child that age, they never touch it. But when the history was looked at into, it was that thing of locking dogs, mistreating them at it to make them Kali. But what happened is that those dogs don't become Kali, they become psychotic. Okay. Yeah. So we have to be put in a way where a dog, just like a human being, is put in the psychological situation where they're safe, they're happy, they're okay, and they have trust. Okay. So what do, what do I need? Because um, everyone wants a dog that will protect them. So if by locking them in a corner somewhere, uh, tying them uh, the whole day, what, what other uh, means can we use mm -hmm. to still make sure that the dog is happy and at the same time protecting, uh, providing protection for the family? What people do not understand, which is, which is, which, as I said, when they, when they realize it is funny, is when you bring in a dog, and as I say, most people bring dogs and they give it to the gardener. No, when you get a dog and a puppy comes in, you as the household, I know most boys and perhaps the head of the household should have constant relationship with that dog so that dog knows you're its family. Once a dog knows that you're its family, its natural instinct, it will protect you. You don't have to care. Okay. That is why, as they say, the dogs that are more silent and calm are they even the scarier ones because those ones are the ones who you will not know it but when it comes to protecting they just are very protective switch on. yeah okay. so a dog naturally to its family which is you it will protect you because that is what it's psychologically set to do okay uh, thank you very much doctor we'll take a short commercial break when we come back we'll look at the at the fifth one and then maybe move uh, to other uh, animal welfare especially for the dog that we uh, we may need to to talk about for our viewers back at home, today we are talking about uh, animal welfare and we are focusing on the dog. And what you need to, do, uh, to know is that uh, even the dog that you have at home or your neighbor's dog also has uh, freedoms. And as uh, Dr. has explained, we'll be back shortly. Don't go anywhere. Kusa Broadcasting Awards 2021 is here. KTN Farmers TV has been selected as the People's Choice TV station and we need your help to bring the award home. To vote for KTN Farmers TV as your favorite broadcaster in the People's Choice Award category, SMS the word Kusa to 15601 and follow the prompt. Voting ends on 23rd April 2021. Voting is absolutely free. Fish business can be a risky business. From hatchery management. If we say hatch 400,000 eggs a month, you find that what we put into the system could be 50% of that. Breeding and regulating the male to female ratio. Don't just set up a hatchery just because you feel like you want to start selling. You, you, for, for you to reduce mortality, you have to invest in a good hatchery where you can be able to, you know, maintain all the conditions required. To acquiring a sustainable market. Catfish has more demand than any other fish right now in Kenya. But it does not need to be fishy or murky waters for you. On Fish Business, we break it down for you. Whether you're a beginner or an expert, our weekly episodes will leave you knowledge richer. Think outside the box with us on Fish Business every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Uh, 
Uh, welcome back to AgriTalk. Um, thank you for keeping it, Katie and Farmers TV. Today we are talking about animal welfare and we are looking at the dog. And with me in studio is uh, Dr. Kavosa Mudoga, who is the uh, companion animal campaign manager at the World Animal Protection. Uh, Dr. Tari, uh, we've, we, you've told us about the freedoms, the five mm -hmm. freedoms that he, uh, the dog has. Um, now, we also um, seen, especially those of us who live in urban centers, sometimes there are a lot of stray dogs. Where do they come from? And yes, where do they come from? So as I said, in, in Africa right now, we don't have what is called a true stray. Unfortunately, most of what we have are free roamings. Mm -hmm. So like you have problems, like you said in Nairobi about stray dogs. And I know two years ago, we worked with the Nairobi County and we actually went around and what we found out is that most of these strays you're seeing are actually quite a number of them a, are owned by street families. So now the only problem is for street families that they have no abode or fencing where they can, where they can be. Mm -hmm. So during the, the daytime when the street families are going fending for themselves, the dogs are free. But in the evening, if you notice in the evening where they congregate, all the dogs come in again. Second, we have the informal settlements, like places like Kibera and the rest. Most of those places, each house has a dog, or they have a dog that guards the kiosk when they go back home. But the thing with Kibera is that there are no fences. And as I say, at times, dogs can get social, and then they can go for adventures. And the problem is, is that twice a year, there is what you call animals going, the females go on heat. Mm -hmm. And when they go on, on heat, dogs tend to forget their domesticated state and go in the wild, their wild state because they want to mate and produce the next lot. Yeah. So now the third area of what we call, but I would say in urban areas, what is a true stray, is many like you and I have a dog, we have a male and a female. But we don't take measures when the female is at heat to keep her away from the male or we either don't get a vet to either castrate the male or spay the female. Maybe it's because of lack of knowledge or cost. So every six months there's a whole set of puppies. You give two, by the time you've given two, you still have three remaining. You don't know what to do with them. They're mm -hmm. growing big, they're costing you food. So what do most people do? Nairobi, open the gate and? I let them go. And you wonder, um, who's supposed to take care of that dog? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> let me ask this. Mm. Um, is in castrating and denying the female um, the, no, the, uh, the male partner, isn't that infringing on their freedom also as well? Actually, no. It's just like your wife, if you're married, is, why, why don't you make her pregnant every year, on and off? People do not understand pregnancy actually takes a lot on a female dog. Because mm. that sh a, a, a fetus, and, and unlike a human being who has one, these dogs have four to four, and I think the craziest have about 11. Mm -hmm. That fetus that grows is going to take off from the mother's physical system. When they are born, the nutrition of her producing milk, even a human being, you know how women, after breastfeeding, she is, some women are just drained. If you don't have a drink or food nearby, and mm -hmm. some women just lose weight because of the effort just produce milk for one human child. And we're talking about a dog with five. That's why you see most pregnant dogs look as if they are in a state of famine and about to drop down. And because of that lack of proper nutrition, half their puppies end up dying because of lack of proper nutrition. So even for dogs, you have to regulate. A dog doesn't have to have puppies every year. Yep, mm -hmm. you can go two or three years or you can have one lot a year and then she skips one. Yeah, it, it's, it's not going to do an issue. The only problem is for the poor male, when he smells on heat, it kind of sends him psychotic. Because <laughs> yeah, he has waited six months to have his fun. <laughs> and then you're denying and him. And then you're denying him. It's not like human beings or higher mammals like chimpanzees where, you know, it's, it's not only for reproduction, it's also for, for, fun. for fun and procreation and for bonding. <laughs> so for him, yes, he can go a bit psychotic. But once she stops producing her hormones, he calms down. Okay. Okay. Yes. That is why I say if you have a female, if you have a male and you don't want to produce, if you castrate him, it's not so bad on him because without, with less testosterone, it doesn't stimulate him as much as he feels an entire male. Mm -hmm. And castrating a male does not make him less aggressive. Most people do not understand. They'll still be aggressive. They will still be aggressive. They'll still be your guard dog. The only thing is they get fat. But <laughs> okay. Interesting. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when it comes to... Um, 
control. Uh, l no, let me ask first. If I'm looking for a dog, yes. what do I need to look for? First of all, you say we have dogs that are from the tiny dogs that you see most people in apartments living to the giant bobo. Mm -hmm. So dogs are defined for their need. So now, do you want a companion animal? Do you want a guard dog? Or do you want a farm dog? Okay. So now, apart from that, is that different dogs have got temperaments. And depending on your temperament in the household, especially of children, if you have children, you have to understand the temperament of that dog. So now that's what we are saying. When you're going to choose a dog, you have to first see where you live, the space you have. Two, dogs require entertainment. The way you go jogging, they need to go at least twice a week. That's why you see people in Karura and, and Aboretum and on roads, because dogs need to expel that energy. Three is how big a dog. You cannot keep a German Shepherd or a Boar Bull in an apartment. Okay. No, you need a smaller, <laughs> a smaller dog. dog. Okay. Apart from that, a dog is for life. And that is 15 years. So if you're buying it for a small child, that's good because by the time the child is going to university, then that dog has reached a point where it's, so, it's reached the end of its life, so you're actually euthanizing it and putting it to sleep. But if that is not your goal, remember, it's just like human child, it's 15 years. 15 years of walking, feeding, medical treatment, and loving. Mm -hmm. So you, s you have to sit down as a family and think this out. Once you think this out and you know what you want and what you want, then it will determine what size, what breed, and what temperament of dog. And that's where people go wrong, where they s because my neighbor has this one, and you're so excited, you go home and you bring it to your house, and it's totally the wrong animal. So the next thing, you're running to KSPCA or finding your vet to adapt it to somebody, or like some wise Kenyans do, just throw it outside the gate. OK. Talking <laughs> of the, the ones thrown outside the gate, which is the best way to control this? Um, stray dogs. Uh, there was some time I, I was telling you earlier, mm -hmm. uh, the county decided to just give them poison. The poisoning doesn't help because I said, as long as the people who have the dogs do not do responsible dog ownership and stop their dogs, limit their dogs production processes, you will kill those ones. Within six months, you're back the same place because the equal number of dogs have been thrown out onto the streets and they're now adults and they're starting to produce. Mm. So it's just a constant waste of time. So now what the one thing we're doing is right now, as I know the county governments are doing, and even the, in the Kenya National Rabies Elimination Program, is that they're bringing in the concept of responsible dog ownership, where people are taught how to responsibly take care of their dogs. And then to decide whether they want a male or a female, and if they have a male or a female, do you want to produce, you know what to produce, and what you need to do. Apart from that is that there are the veterinary services that are available to stop dogs from, to spare and neuter dogs. And when we did a program with the Nairobi County and Trust Neuter and Release in 2019, because the people of Kibera requested that, that was their issue. You should have seen the outcome of people coming in. And we're talking about everyday Kibera residents, either bringing a male or a female dog for her to be neutered, and then for, for treatment, and then also now for vaccination. And, and I said, we got this data because we went around with them asking these people in the in income settlements and the street people because they seem to be an issue. And that was a request they had for us. Mm -hmm. So what we need is for county governments to help provide these services. Yep. For Nairobi counties, you can see they're limited with the number of vets and where the dog pound is and the equipment. They cannot do that. And then we have the private vet, but the private vet charge is a bit high that for everyone, ain't you? So how do we do this? Because there's a need for the dog owner. Just the same way the Mdaiga dog owner has a need, the dog owner in Mkuruanjenga has the same need, but he cannot afford it. Mm -hmm. And that's what they require. So now, how do we bridge that gap to provide those services for proper health care, training on responsible dog ownership, and helping them understand reproduction cycle and giving spaying and neuter services? Because at the end of the day, that is the most structured way. Because once you, you halt the ability for a dog to produce, then you know there's no production of puppies. And with no production of puppies, then we know sometime down the line, <laughs> those dogs we see on the street will die off. OK. Um, and also, we have dogs that um, I think dogs are the most, um, are, the, uh, um, are, are most of the time finding themselves in trouble. If you look at the animals that you find knocked down by vehicles on the road, majority of them are dogs. How do you dispose this, uh, these particular dogs? Um, these and dogs, whose responsibility yeah. is it? 
because mm. sometimes... The responsibility is actually the Nairobi County Veterinary Department and the Public Health Department. They are supposed to collect these carcasses and then they take them and they either incinerate them or bury them. At the dog pound, they have a facility. Though, as I said, right now, they realize they have to expand and create one or two more. Yep. But then, unfortunately for now, what happens is that they're just thrown in the garbage truck they are just left there. and then they end up in the landfill. And the problem is these rotting carcasses, they're, op they're their means to open means to pass disease. And in these landfills, we have uh, everyday Kenyans who that's the only place where they can get their source of food or source of income by getting metals and the rest. So now we are causing a public health danger to them. And especially where these landfills and these carcasses come into waterways, that is now a whole other <laughs> public health issue when these carcasses, diseased or non-diseased, now enter and waterways and, if, and, and infect them. So it, it, it's, it's really a very wide thing that it brings the veterinary side, the public health side, and then NEMA, the environmental side, to actually sit down and think about it because it's bigger than what we actually see. Yeah. OK. Um, in terms of we, uh, we talked about feeding these animals. Let's now talk about vaccination. How important is vaccination, especially for the dogs? And how often is it supposed to be administered? So vaccination is very important for dogs because dogs have two types of diseases. They have the ones that are spread from dog to dog. And these diseases can actually either cause death or they can cause, dis they can cause diseases that have long-term effects, uh, just like human beings, blindness, deafness, liver function problems, kidney function problems, and that means the rest of the animal's life it has an issue. So for most of those diseases, and then the other ones we have, which is the zoonotic ones, which is now rabies. And the problem with rabies is when a dog gets rabies and it bites a human being, you get rabies. And unlike the, the COVID-19, which, which is a very serious disease, COVID-19, at least if you get infected, we have, as Africans, we have a 99% chance of survival. With rabies, once you get infected and it sets in, it's 100% death fatality. We are now here saying in Kenya that from last year to this year, we have had 2,500 people dying from COVID. But in Kenya, it's estimated we lose up to 2,000 people a year. From, from rabies. From rabies. Yes, but it's a neglected Rich. tropical disease that is kind of like, since it happens to the poor and in rural areas, it's kind of like forgotten. And the problem with rabies also comes out, it looks like meningitis or cerebral malaria. Mm -hmm. So it can be mistaken and somebody gets buried and until you go back and you find somebody was bitten by a dog and has rabies. So for dogs, as we say, for those dog diseases that dogs get, main, it's mainly distemper and parvo that kill dogs. So. It's good to vaccinate a dam or a mother before she gets pregnant. So when she gives birth, she already has circulating antibodies. That not when before she gives birth, even before she mates, so she has them. Because some of these things can go from the mother to puppies while they're still in the, in the uterus. So the first three months, the babies are covered. And mostly, the, ones that are, the two major ones that are important are parvo and distemper. So now, parvo virus is a virus where, as you were making fun earlier, where they say, uh, mm -hmm. because it coincides with the time teeth okay. either come down or the dog starts losing its milk teeth because that's a time when it affects them and what it does it causes diarrhea bloody diarrhea and then the dog just after two or three days dies then we have distemper that has almost similar clinical signs but distemper it can also have where you see the dog getting blisters on the nose on the eyes on the hands and the feet and in a non-vaccinated dog or a dog that is low immunity, mm -hmm. it can actually even cause death in an adult dog. So now that is why it's important for puppies to have a mother who has already been vaccinated by parvo. And as soon as it reaches eight weeks, it gets its first parvo vaccination. So we don't get that death. Yeah, meno, <laughs> as people put it. Mm -hmm. And as for distemper, it's good to cover distemper because I think in 2018, we had an outbreak of distemper that went through Africa. It came through Tanzania. It came into Kenya and we had a time when quite a number of dogs, puppies and adults across Kenya in sequence just died because of that disease. And that's the that problem with, with distemper. As for rabies, as I said, rabies, um, most dogs, distemper and parvo, a puppy will get the first booster, second booster, and then third booster. Then after that, it's every year. And the same way for rabies, it will get us two boosters, and then after that, every year. 
Okay. And that covers the dog. So now what we tell people is that if you cannot afford the others, at least cover rabies. In Nairobi, it may cost you between 2,000 to 3,000, depending on the private vet. In rural areas, depending whether it's a county or it's the, the rural vet, you can get it from as little as 150 to 500 shillings. And that covers your dog every year against a cost of if your dog bites a person and you go to co police and you don't have a vaccination certificate, that's five doses of prevention of the anti-rabies for a human being. And in Kenya, that anti-rabies goes between 1,500 1, to 3,000 shillings, depending on availability, <laughs> and that's times five. So you talk about 7,000 to 10,000 shillings, and hoping your dog only bit one person. So that's a, between 150 and 7,500. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, especially in the rural areas. <laughs> I, I remember my mom paid someone 7,000, because yes. uh, they came and they were bitten by the dog. Yeah, the cost of the vaccine. So luckily she had, uh, the dogs had been vaccinated, but still they had to, the, the person has still to go for anti-rabies. But the question is, if the dogs were bitten in your compound, then if the good police officer will say that person came into your compound, so that, that is not on your mother. If perhaps the dog caught him on the street, then that's another, yeah, that's another case. Okay. <laughs> so um, are these diseases treatable if, uh, by the time we are noticing it's already? Uh, unfortunately for pavo and distemper, if the dog is healthy and well fed, you've got a chance of survival, as I said, a chance. Mm -hmm. But for rabies, once the animal starts showing symptoms and once a person, human being starts showing symptoms, um, you're dying. It's, it's not a matter of whether they're going to survive. It's 100% okay. fatality. Okay. Um, and in terms of uh, feeding these animals, how yes. often or how many times a day should we feed these uh, dogs? I know people feed their dogs once a day. So it depends. Puppies, we usually say three to four times a day. Just like a human being, a baby is fed several times a day. But as they grow older, then it will become three times a day. Then when they're older, two times a day. Then when they become adults, you can decide whether you want to be giving your dog its meal once a day. Because even as human beings, if you wake up and you have like a light porridge or a light uh, a breakfast, you can actually go through the day and then have your meal in the evening. But the only thing is those dogs that are having one meal a day, then you have to ensure, okay, in the morning, give them something small, milk with bread with some milk and bread with some soup, because some dogs, it depends what it is, something small to start their day. But you need to keep, make sure they have water available the whole day, just like a human being who goes a whole day. So now, as I said, it just depends on your breed of dog and what you sequence it. So. When we talk about a meal, we're not talking about big meals. You have to know, and a vet or animal health professional can tell you the volume of food your dog eats. And when we talk about dogs, their food has to be, have a carbohydrate, a vegetable, and a protein, mm -hmm. by the way. And we talk about proteins. Dogs don't always have to have a meat protein. They can actually, on occasion, survive on dengue, beans, soya, <laughs> quite well. <laughs> Some people, your dogs, you see dogs starving, and where we've gone up country, they say, what do you have? And I said, yes, dogs need meat, but when there's no meat, this can sustain. Okay. Yeah, so when people are taught the combinations <laughs> of food, we're like, wow. And me, I'm surprised. Yeah. So, now I'd, yeah. so just like a human being, a dog needs a certain amount of calories, proteins, whatever. So now what you do is that you get a meal, that volume, and then you either decide you're giving it once a day, or you divide that meal, and then you give in the morning, and then give the remaining volume in the evening. But during the day, just make sure it has water at libtum. Oh, okay. Um, let's let's uh, touch a little bit about uh, dog breeds. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know there are countries, so I don't know whether we have the same in Kenya. There are particular breeds that you cannot have them in this country. I don't know whether we have them. And if um, there are, uh, which are these breeds that are not allowed in some countries? <laughs> Most of those breeds, like the pit bull, and I don't think in Kenya anyone has brought in pit bulls yet. But is it allowed to have them? Um, Right now in Kenya, we are developing animal welfare legislation and regulations. So now some of those dangerous breeds will be listed. So now at present in Kenya, we don't have what is called a dangerous breed that globally, that uh, globally they are banned. But we do have breeds that can be dangerous, like Rottweilers, Dobermans, and Boar Bulls. Because some of these breeds, depending on their breeding lines, some can become and level-headed. Others are already by genetics, they're already wild and are very hard to tame. Yeah. So mostly what we say is that people who have 
those ones in that lineage, most of them end up, I think, going to the police or army because those cannot be kept within the situation. And I know in Kenya we had a time where we had a set of baubles that were trained, because a baubul is actually trained to be with cows in the middle of Laikipia, when nobody's there, so when the lion comes, these baubles can chase the lion or can chase the hyena. So it's actually a fighting war dog. Mm. So now, we had cases earlier where people brought these ones in and did not realize as puppies that that's eventually what's going to happen. But over time, the bobble society has worked in Kenya, and now most of the bobbles we have are bobbles that are tame and more domesticated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why I'm saying when you're going to select a dog, you have to actually observe the parents to see the temperament of the parents, because the temperament will decide what the temperament of your dog is. So we have dogs that can be dangerous, but not the ones that are globally considered dangerous and banned. Okay. So when we, when we talk about... Um the welfare of the dog. How, from all what you've told me, how do you think we fare as a country? As a country, we've got, at least we're there, we're on the move, but we've got quite a bit to go. And I say, when I talk about quite a bit, I think more in the urban areas than even <laughs> in the rural areas. But it has been picking up. Mm -hmm. For the past five years, it has been picking up. Uh, counties themselves are picking it up because now when, when the county, that's one thing that, 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 enable, that, that is a positive for devolution, is when county governments now got their own rights to how they run their counties and veterinary departments now within the county, we are doing things as the county. Because you know right now in the county, whenever you make a year's program, you have to sit with one inch and one inch tell you mm -hmm. what it is. So you develop it as per with the one inch. And they've brought these things up, then now county governments are being able to bring up these programs. Some of them have started and others are picking up to help manage these issues and see how they're going. So it started and it's picking up and we're going ahead. But I think, as I said, in urban centers where we tend to live more by ourselves and like rural areas where it's community, it's gonna take a bit more uh, working. <laughs> but I know is that the good thing is also with the new education system is that from standard three and standard four, animal welfare is brought in. And one of the two subjects they use is how to take care of your dog and how to take care of your donkey. So we're gonna have a new generation of kids, most of them nine standard four, who now are being educated within the education system. So when they become adults in the next 10, 15 years, then they will be, you will be able to see the drastic difference. Even if right now the present older generation, we are slowly coming in and seeing how this education and advocacy can be done within them. Okay. I'm told we have two minutes. So in those two minutes, I want to understand uh, or help our viewers to understand how important is a vet and how um, <laughs> close should we be to, our, to, to the vet? Um, whether, whether you have cows, whether mm -hmm. you have, um, and even if you have a cat. Vets are very important towards for, for, for the for vets and animal health assistants are very important because right now, as you see, like COVID, COVID is a disease that we said was jumped from animals to human beings. Mm. A zoonotic. A zoonotic disease. And also that means there are some diseases that your livestock, your companion animal, your working animal, if they have and you're not careful and you don't have somebody educating you, training you and teaching you, can actually j affect you as a family member. We're not talking about, we can't, we can talk about rabies, we can talk about childhood diseases like diarrhea and worms. They come across. Apart from that is if you're a livestock keeper, that animal you're taking care of, you're investing it in it. You want those investments to come back to profit you. If you do not have proper production and health care, mm -hmm. you're just at a point where you end up losing out and you're making losses and it's no benefit. So that is why your veterinarian is very, very vital within the society. And as I said, they are the link and the bridge. The veterinarian is the link and the bridge between human health, animal and environment. Most people don't see us that way, but the work we do is the work that bridges from things overflowing into the human side or overflowing into the environment or the environment flowing into, <laughs> into. the livestock and animals. Yeah, that's okay. all I can say. So um, do we have enough vets as a country? No country in the world has enough vets. Mm -hmm. And the goodness of the Kenyan vets, they do tropical medicine. So they're also, our vets and animal health assistants, so they're also hot cake. 
We have our neighboring countries that are also coming up and they need veterinarians. So, <laughs> so, there's, a, they so they, there's, a, there's a gap globally, globally and in Africa. So now the veterinary profession before in the early 80s, everyone would run for it. But right now it's slowed down, but we need more veterinarians. We need more animal health assistance to come into this place. And the goodness with the veterinarian is that you can either decide you want to work in government or you can come out and you can work privately. The earnings as a veterinarian are good, very good, <laughs> even animal health assistant. You have your own working hours. And if you don't want to do clinical medicine, we have research medicine. These COVID vaccines that we have done, the companies like Pfizer and the rest, the lead researchers are veterinarians. Oh, okay. That is how big it is. Veterinarians have gone into human health. The lead researcher for HIV in Africa is a veterinarian. Awesome. <laughs> okay. so, so getting a veterinary degree opens a vast area of how and where you can go in future in okay. your career. Thank you very much, uh, Doc. Um, and thank you for sparing time to be with us. I'm sure our viewers have learned a lot, especially um, on how to take care of their dogs. They say it's the uh, uh, man's best friend. Now they know so they need to take care of their friend and that they have rights. Um, until next time, that is it from AgriTalk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agriculture was previously a function of national government under the Ministry of Agriculture. It is currently a devolved ministry, no longer under the sole control of the national government. The biggest producer of Irish potatoes in this country is Elgeyo Maraquet. Because the production has been concentrated around Mount Elgon alone. That's about three folds. It was expected that devolving this key ministry would lead to better